Good evening, church family. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, I invite you to open it with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, is today we celebrate one of the most important days in the history of humanity, the day where Jesus went to the cross. But there's good news. He didn't stay there on the cross, and he didn't stay there in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he rose again in victory, and we're going to celebrate that on Sunday. But tonight, we want to think about... (laughs) the cross. Luke chapter 23, let me begin reading in verse 13. The Bible says, Pilate called together the chief priest, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, you have brought me this man as one who misleads the people. But in fact, after examining him in your presence, I have found no grounds to charge this man with those things you accuse him of. Neither has Herod, because he sent him back to us. Clearly he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore I will have him whipped and then release him. Then they all cried out together, Take this man away, release Barabbas to us. I want you to underscore that word Barabbas. We're going to come back to that. He had been thrown into prison for a rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate addressed them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what has this man done wrong? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him whipped and then release him. But they kept up the pressure, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified, and their voices won out. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. And released the one they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for rebellion and murder. But he handed Jesus over to their will. Verse 32, two other criminals were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others, yet let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God, since you are undergoing the same punishment. We are punished justly because we're getting back for what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray together this evening. Father, I pray today that you would stand in my body, that you would rest on my mind, that you would speak through my lips. Father, tonight as we consider the crucifixion, the cross of Jesus Christ, Lord, we want to go ahead and say thank you on credit for what you've done. Lord, it was my sin, it was our sin that put you there, and yet you went there for us. So Lord, I pray that in this moment, that we would be reminded of the glory of the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, I want to speak to you on the subject, pictures of the cross. Last year, I was invited to preach at Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary outside of Memphis, Tennessee. It's the seminary that Adrian Rogers, that great preacher, was responsible for starting. It's just across the street from Bellevue Baptist Church. You can see the church on I-40. There are three crosses as you are traveling east towards Memphis there at Bellevue Baptist Church. There's one cross that stands at 150 feet. It's the largest cross. To the left and to the right are two different crosses, 120 feet. 
You know, as I began to see those crosses, I began to study what are the largest crosses in America. If you were to go to Illinois, there off of Interstate 57 and 70, you would find a cross that towers at 198 feet. If I were to take you down to St. Augustine, Florida, there the great cross is 208 feet. But that's not the largest in North America. If you were to go to Branson, Missouri in 2018, the Branson Cross was erected at 220 feet, a very large cross. But that's not the largest cross in the world. If you were to go to Fallen, Spain, there the cross of the valley can be seen at 20 miles away. It towers at 500 feet. It is a great cross. Now, this evening, we're not talking about the physical length of a cross. We're thinking about the greatness of the cross and what the cross means for us. Here's the probing question that I want to ask you as we get started this evening. What is it about the cross that makes it a symbol of peace, victory, salvation, and hope? After all, the cross is an instrument of death. It was a cruel way that they were to strike fear into those who would create murders. In fact, the Persians, they created the cross, but the Romans perfected the cross. And the goal of the cross, it was to strike fear into anyone who would rebel against Rome. How is it that this symbol of death and fear and pain, that God could turn it into love and glory and salvation? That's what we're going to look at this evening as we consider the three crosses from Luke chapter 23. Think about the crosses and the responses to the cross on that particular Good Friday. There were some who were convinced by the cross. I think about that Roman centurion who in both Mark and Matthew says that surely this man is the Son of God. He would have been in charge of many crucifixions, but that guard on that day, he knew that there was something different about Jesus. There were some who were convinced by a cross. There were others who were convicted by the cross. The Bible says that as the crowds went away, they beat their chest. That was a sign of mourning and pain. Even the crowds knew there was something different about this man named Jesus. There were others who had compassion on the cross. I think of Joseph of Arimathea, who he came and delivered Jesus off of the cross. There were some who even cowered there on the cross. They stood in the background. They didn't want anyone to know that they were watching. And all of us watch this must respond in some way to the greatness of the cross. There are three pictures that I want you to see this evening from the text, and the first is this. I want us to see the picture of substitution. Come back to verse 18 where the Bible says, Then they all, that being the crowds, cried out together, Take this man away, release Barabbas. Now the question that we must ask this evening, who is Barabbas. The name Barabbas is a double name, Bar-Abbas. Now, you've heard that name Bar before. Think about this, Simon, son of Bar-Jonah. Or when someone is going through training, we call this Bar-Mitzvah, a son of the law. Or how about that blind Bartimaeus? That would be that man who was blind, who was the son of Timaeus. The word bar means son. Many of you can pick up on the other part of that word, bar abbas, bar abba. Remember there in Romans 8, 15, where the Bible tells us that we cry out, abba, father. So literally, this man's name means a son of a father. Now, what exactly do we know about Barabbas. We don't know too much about Barabbas. We don't know if he was single or married. We don't know anything about his family, but there's something that God wants you to know about Barabbas. You say, why is that? He never speaks one word in the Bible, and yet he's mentioned in all four Gospels. That's significant because the birth of Jesus is only mentioned in two Gospels. 
We know that the resurrection is found in all four Gospels, but other than the resurrection, there's only one miracle that is included in all of the Gospels. That's the feeding of the 5,000. We would say that Nicodemus was a, an important figure in the life of the Bible, but Nicodemus is only found in John three times. But this man was mentioned in all four Gospels. Let's take it one step further. We would say that Judas was an important figure in the life of of the Bible. I mean, after all, this man named Judas, he was the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And Judas is only mentioned in 32 verses of the New Testament. Did you know that Barabbas is mentioned 38 times in the New Testament? God wants you to know something about Barabbas. There's something about this man that speaks to the substitution of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to the white pages this evening in Scripture. Not just what we find in the text, but I want to give you some historical background that begins to open up our eyes to what's taking place there on that Good Friday. It was the custom, the Bible says, according to Matthew, where there would be the release of a prisoner at Passover. This happened nearly every year. Now Pilate has already tried Jesus. He finds no grounds in the accusation. Jesus is sent to Herod. Herod, too, finds no grounds for the accusation, and Jesus is sent back to Pilate. Pilate knows that he has a situation on his hands. You say, why is that, Pastor? Well, he knew that the crowds were about to uproar, and so he says, what if I scourge him and then release him? Perhaps that would pacify and satisfy those in the crowds. But this crowd did not want to be pacified that day. They had one thing on their mind, and that is the death of Jesus. So there, Barabbas. He would have been 200 yards away outside of Pilate's palace in the dungeon of Antonia. Now, why is that significant? The dungeon of Antonia would have been a dark place. It's where the prisoners were kept just before they were murdered. And so on this day... The crowds begin to to say, we want to kill Jesus. And so Pilate, he says, well, let me give you a plan. What if I'm to release one of these prisoners to you in hopes, watch this, that they would choose this man named Jesus. But the crowds then said, Barabbas. Now put yourself in Barabbas' shoes. Barabbas, he hears his name 200 yards away. He can't hear Pilate. He only hears the crowds that say, Barabbas, Barabbas. And then he hears the word, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Just a few minutes later, there's a Roman centurion who would have come with some keys and unlocked the door. Barabbas would have been enchained, and he would have walked down that long, dark dungeon, and he thinks that his death is imminent. It's just around the corner. And then he gets to the end of the tunnel and he realizes that he's a free man. Justly condemned, rightly sentenced, and yet free to go. Barabbas is a picture of us. We are Barabbas. Do you see the play on words? Barabbas, a son of the father, is guilty, but the son of the father, Jesus, is innocent. A son of the father, he deserves the punishment. The son of the father, Jesus himself, he does not deserve the punishment. And Jesus has to go on a cross, and Barabbas is set free. Are you seeing the picture, what what the text is telling us? That Barabbas is all of us. This is the scandal of the gospel. This is at the heart of Christianity. This is why we celebrate together tonight, folks, because Jesus died in our place. We are Barabbas. He died the death that we deserve to die so that we could have eternal life. Now, maybe you're here this evening and you think, Where does the Bible corroborate this? The Bible says in Galatians 3.13 that Jesus redeemed us by the curse of sin by becoming a curse for us. Do you get that? 
Jesus became the curse for us so we could be redeemed from that curse. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He who knew no sin became sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God. He came in our place. Jesus in your place. This is the picture of Barabbas, the cross of substitution. Jesus died so that you would not die that eternal death. Praise the Lord for the first picture of the cross. I want you to see a second picture of the cross this evening. Not only a picture of substitution, I want you to also see a picture of forgiveness. Come with me now to verse 32. It says, Two other criminals were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, in Latin, we call that Calvary. Greek, that's Golgotha. It's the place of the skull, not because there were skulls there, but because the rock looked like a skull. And it says they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Luke records three of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. Luke records the first, the second, and the last saying on the cross. And Jesus says, there says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I want you to think about that this evening, exactly what Jesus says. Forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Who was Jesus forgiving that day? He was forgiving the people of Israel who put him there on the cross. He was forgiving the soldiers who were mocking them. He was forgiving those who had cast lots. He's forgiving Pilate and Herod and anyone who would turn to him for salvation. He's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness. Forgiveness literally means to send away. We talked about last Sunday that we can't build systems of forgiveness based on performance, but rather we have to base it on God's grace. God's grace is God giving to us that which, which we don't deserve. Mercy, God withholding the things that we do deserve. Not only that we have to give grace, but watch this. We also have to receive grace. I have to believe that there's someone in here this evening that you're just having a hard time receiving God's grace, God's forgiveness in your life. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This week that you've said, I'm going to have victory in an area of my life. I'm no longer going to gossip. I'm no longer going to look at that thing on the internet. I'm no longer going to do this thing over here. And yet you find yourself in this perpetual pattern of just feeling like a royal mess up. And we're weighed down by guilt and shame. Now, stay with me this evening. There's actually a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt says that what I've done has bad. Shame says I am bad. Guilt is based on my actions, but shame is based on my identity. So shame goes one step further and doesn't just say what I've done is bad. It says I am bad. And Satan is whispering these lies in your ear. God could never love you. After what you did this week, the things that you said, the places that you went, God could never love you. And if you were in Christ Jesus, the Bible says there is now for no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is not a license to sin. What this is is a reminder that the cross deals with the heaviest of sins the cross deals with our shame. The cross deals with our guilt. And this is the cross of forgiveness. If you are thankful for God's forgiveness this evening, would you say amen? amen. We are thankful for God's forgiveness. The year was 1999. There was a Cambodian preacher who stepped into Cambodian or Cambodia. He did not expect that there would be many who in this remote village would receive Jesus. He was actually surprised by the welcome that he received. He went in to preach about the good news of Jesus Christ, and he thought that there would be many in this remote village who would have called upon the name of Buddha, 
called upon the gods of their ancestors, called upon the spirits of the wind and the fire. This preacher did not think that he would have much success. And to his surprise, when he preached the gospel, this is a true story, everyone in the village prayed to receive Jesus. He was shocked. He had never been met with such receptivity. He went to someone and he says, tell me about what's, what's going on. I've preached in other places before in Cambodia, but with never this type of success of people responding to the gospel. And there was a lady that said, well, 20 years ago, when the revolutionaries came, that anyone who tried to rise up against the communists, they would kill. They would go from remote village to remote village, and just before they executed those in the village, they would make them dig their graves. And so everyone began digging their graves, expecting that they were about to die. said, however, that as everyone began to call upon the wind and the fire, and someone called upon Buddha, there was this one lady in the village. She didn't know Jesus, but at a young age, she heard about the God who died on a cross. And she thought that if this God who died on the cross suffered, that maybe that he would understand her suffering and their suffering. And as people began to call out in the village, save us, they were calling out to the wind and to the fire, they were calling out to Buddha, this one lady, she said, Jesus Christ, if you are real, would you save me? She had just heard about it at a young age, but she didn't know the significance of, of Christianity. To their amazement in the muggy skies that day, is everyone looked up just afraid that they were about to be shot, all of the revolutionaries had left. There was no explanation. And for 20 years, from 1979 to 1999, this person said, we have been waiting for someone to come and tell us about this Jesus who died on a cross. This Jesus who died on a cross, he came to give us a message, and that message is one of forgiveness. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be made white as snow. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus said there on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the cross of forgiveness. I want you to see one more cross that we see here in this text, and that's the cross of and a picture of eternity. Notice what the Bible says here in verse 39. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man, this Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I want you to underscore that word, paradise. It's a Persian word that describes a garden. This is an eternal world w- word because this takes us back to Genesis chapter 3 there in the Garden of Eden. It's the same word that describes the Garden of Eden. But what went wrong in Eden, Jesus is making forever right in all eternity. When Jesus died on the cross, he says, I am coming to make a new Jerusalem. I am coming, and I will remember you when I come into my kingdom. The cross and the picture of eternity. The Bible says in John 14 that I've gone to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you so. And in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And where I am, there you will be with me also. I want you to think for just a moment about those three on the cross, the two criminals beside Jesus and Jesus himself. There was a story about a pastor in Philadelphia. He was studying one day, 
He was at a well-known church in Philadelphia, and there was someone who came to knock on his door. Not many people knew about this special study that he had, and there was someone who knocked on the door, and it was a visitor who had heard that there was a preacher here in Philadelphia that studied there during the day. This particular man, he says, I need you to tell me about this Jesus. And so the preacher there in Philadelphia, he was busy, but he thought, well, I will quickly take him to this text in Luke 23 to share salvation. And I love what that preacher said. In fact, I want you to think about those who were on the cross beside Jesus on that day. It says that there is one on the left and one on the right. I want you to come over here with me to the one who is on the right. This was the one who was mocking Jesus. This was the one who says, if you could save yourself, then save us and others. Here's what that preacher from Philadelphia told the man who came to visit him. He says, the one man who was on the the cross, the criminal, sin was in him and it was on him. That criminal who was mocking Jesus, sin was in him, he was a sinner by nature, but the Judgment against sin was on him as well. Now come with me over here to to this other man on the cross. He says, surely this is the, the Son of God because we deserve to be here. Justly that, that we have sinned, but this man, he doesn't deserve to, to be here. To this criminal, sin was in him. But because of his declaration, it was no longer on him. Why is that? Because Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. For one man, sin was in him and on him. For another man, sin was in him but not on him. Now how was it that this man and this man could have a different trajectory? It all comes to this man. Because this man right him here, Sin was on him, but not in him. The sin was never in Jesus, the perfect, spotless Son of God. That's why John the Baptist could say, There, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There, Jesus, he was tempted in the wilderness, but he never succumbed to sin. Jesus lived his entire earthly ministry, and he never sinned. Why? He is fully God and fully man. Sin is not in him. And because sin is not in him, he could go to the cross. And there he could lay down his life so that you and I could be saved. For Jesus, sin was on him, the wrath of God, the judgment of God in that moment when Jesus lifted out his hands and he said, to Telestai, it is finished. The curse of sin was on him. That's what Galatians 3.13 says. That he redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse himself. For Jesus' sin was on him but not in him. And because of that, he could tell this criminal over here, sin is in you but it's not on you. Because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that is why we celebrate Good Friday. You've come in here today and you wonder why is Good Friday good? It's because there is a God that sin was not in him, but sin came on him there on the cross. Every sinful thought, action, and deed, all of sin of all time was placed on him. And because not only he died, but he rose again in victory, he could tell this man on the cross Sin is in you, but not on you. Maybe you come this evening, and you've never come to the cross. You've never experienced the forgiveness of the cross. You've never experienced the substitution of the cross. You've never experienced the eternity of the cross. Today, this God, whose sin is on him, but not in him, says, if you'll come to me, sin may be in you, but it is no longer on you. Because I am the Son of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here in just a moment, we are going to sing several songs of celebration, but during this first song, I'm going to ask our staff and our ministry leaders if they will be up front here, because today you may need to respond to this Jesus. You've come to a Good Friday service And today, sin is in you and on you, but you can move from this criminal to this criminal where sin is in you but not on you because of this man whose sin was on him but not in him. You say, what does it take in order to be saved? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. If you would simply repent of your sin and turn to Jesus in faith, he takes that sin off of you. Just like Barabbas, the guilty goes free and the one who is perfect laid down his life for you so you could have eternal life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the cross. Lord, as we continue in this time of celebration of the cross, Lord, I pray if there's someone here today who has never come to the cross, Lord, they've never experienced that forgiveness that we talked about. Lord, I pray that tonight would be the night of their salvation. Lord, that they would trust you in faith this evening. Lord, I pray this evening if there's someone here that may be a child of God, born-again believer, but Lord, they're having a difficult time accepting forgiveness for themselves. Satan is whispering all these lies in their ears. Lord, that they would be reminded that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ because of what he did for us on the cross. So Lord, as we remember what you've done, Lord, we say thank you. In this moment, Lord, I pray that there would be those, if there's anyone here who needs to take a next step with you, Lord, that tonight, Lord, that you would work in hearts. Lord, that you would speak through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that because of you, Lord, sin may be in us, but it doesn't have to be on us. Because Jesus, sin was on you and not in you. And because of that exchange, we have hope. So thank you for the cross, a symbol of hope, a symbol of victory, a symbol of salvation. It is a symbol of peace. And Lord, tonight I pray that you would have your way among us as we continue to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name.